Hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? All right, great. So welcome to this session in this lovely afternoon. Today, we're going to talk about LLM-based applications and how to make them more reliable with the fallback mechanisms. So let's start. First, about me. My name is Bilge. I work as a developer relations engineer at DeepSet. And my work mainly goes around our open source LLM framework, Haystack. Uh, and I will be talking about it a little bit further in the next slides. Uh, it's my first time in Berlin Buzzwords, and I'm, that's why I'm also super excited to be on this stage today. Uh, I am originally from Istanbul. I was born and raised and still live there. Um, and I'm pretty active on social media, so you can find me on Twitter, you can, we can connect on LinkedIn, and all of the codes and the presentations are available on GitHub, so you can also, if you check my GitHub account, you can also see the sources of this presentation. And here's today's agenda. First, we are going to talk about LLMs and RAG. Maybe you've heard about these terms before, maybe you just know them, but don't know very detail. Uh, but just be sure that I will give you the you know, from information that you need uh, for this presentation. Then I'll make a brief introduction to Haystack. Next up, we'll see fallback mechanisms. And if you have any questions during the talk, I will be answering them in the q and session. OK, let's start with the large language models. I think most of you are familiar with this UI. Um, how many of you are using this tool on a daily basis for different tasks? OK, almost like a third of the room. So uh, this is a very famous application that has an LLM running behind. And I also use it mostly for my generative tasks. Uh, but I sometimes use it for question answering. But these LLMs have this very uh, big problem with them. And the problem is they don't know about the latest album of Taylor Swift. Uh, it's, it's a known limitation. It's because this album was released in April this year, but the chaining data of these LLMs were, had this very short cut off time. And the, the model basically doesn't know about what happened in the world after some certain point back in time. So that's why it just says that, oh, this album doesn't belong to Taylor Swift. It's from a Greek artist, Lena Platonos, or something. So it basically denies that there's an album like that. But does it mean that I cannot use these models uh, for, for on data that wasn't in their training data? Um, well, the answer is to that. I can definitely use your large language models to answer questions, even if, the tr even if the information wasn't in their training data. And the way to do that is called retrieval augmented generation. It's a very simple yet very effective method, and I'll show you the details of it. So here, for retrieval augmented generation, what we do is instead of just basically passing the query, we, we provide a more sophisticated prompt to our large language model. And in this prompt, I basically give an instruction, then I provide some relevant context, and then I pass my query. And by looking at the context that I provided, my large language model can then uh, answer this question that I ask as my query. So if you go back to the Taylor Swift example, I give some instructions, say that, OK, answer the question following the given context, and I provide some information, maybe the uh, information about Taylor Swift's albums, and then when I ask the same question, it says that, OK, this album is about Taylor Swift's relationship with Joe. So that's enough for me. It means that I don't need to fine tune the large language models. Uh, I can just provide some relevant context, and it just can use any of the data that I have without having that in its training data. But how do I systematically make that happen? So how do I build an application around this? And this is where Haystack comes into play. Haystack is an open source Python framework for building production-ready LLM applications. 
And when I say production ready, I really mean it, because not only it provides you the tools that you need to build your prototype, but it also helps you to evaluate your system, to take it, it into production, and then keep on monitoring it, because, I mean, if you ever work in production systems, the, creating the POC is just the first step, then you need to do some extra work to, make, to take that into production. And it has two main building blocks. Uh, the components and the pipelines. Components are smaller units. They only have one job to do. And by connecting these components to each other, you can form your pipelines. Uh, but these pipelines doesn't have to be linear. They are directed graphs. So basically, you can think the components as the nodes in the, in the scrap graph, and you can just connect the edges to each other and form your pipeline. Since they are directed graph, they can have loops in it, or they can have branches, and you can then merge those branches based on your use case. So this gives you the ability to have a very flexible pipeline. Uh, I said that Haystack gives you a lot of tools to build your application, but what if you have a very custom use case, or what if you have a certain technology that's only used by you? Then you can just build your own custom component and plug into your pipeline without any problems, and it will just work fine. So this is how the Rack pipeline with Haystack looks like. Um, this is a very minimal implementation of it, and this is the pipeline. Every rectangle in this pipeline is basically a component. And when I have my query, first what I would do is I get my embedding embedder component and create a query embedding. And in order to create this embedding, I can use any of the models that are listed above. I can use some open source models from Hugging Face, such as sentence transformers. I can use Gina models, or if I have my models up in Azure, I can also use them. You can use Olama, for example. And then assuming that I already have some index document in my database, uh, retriever gets that query embedding and returns me the top K relevant documents from my database. And as my database option, I can use again Quadrun, VVA, Neo4j, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, basically any most like very famous uh, databases out there. Next up, a prompt builder, as the name stands, it builds the prompt, but it works in a very different way because the prompts in Haystack, um, they have this Jinja syntax. It means that I can just write this very basic rack prompt, and if you look at the documents part, I just have curly brackets and, if, uh, and for loops or if statements, as if I'm using Jinja in my template. And then I can also provide my uh, variables in curly brackets, and then my prompt builder will then fill in that information with the retrieve documents and the user query. As the last step, generator will take that prompt and basically generate a response. And as to generate the response, I can again use uh, famous uh, large language models out there openly available or the ones that are behind the API. And Actually, this list is longer than that, because if a provider is following an OpenAI API schema, you can just plug it to your Haystack pipeline without any problems. For example, GROC, if you like to use that one. And let's look at the code of it. Um, this is the whole code you need, by the way. So first, I start creating my pipeline here. And then I add my components one by one. So first I have my embedded component. I went with Gina and selected this Gina embeddings v2 model from them. Then the retriever, based on the document store that you like to use, it, it's, you're going to need a different retriever. Then you'll just give your document store instance to that one and choose how many documents, how many relevant documents you like to get. Next up, the prompt builder, it will just take the prompt template that you have. And as a generator, I, I went with Hugging Face API generator, which is use, which one, which can use uh, serverless inference API. It's, it's a service that Hugging Face has. And I went with the Mistral 7B Instruct V3 model. 
and then I connect them to form my pipeline one by one. So text embedder to retriever, retriever to prompt builder, prompt builder to generator, and then I ask the same question again here, and I get some relevant information that is based on the real documents out there. Congratulations, you have just built your very basic LLM-based applications. Um, so the RAG is the minimal example out there, but of course there are multiple examples that you can uh, use uh, to LL you can use LLMs. And this brings us to the fallback mechanism part of the presentation. But here, first, I'd like to introduce you some other use cases of large language models in addition to RAG and show you what can go wrong in these applications and how we can fix them. First, I'll take a sip. All right, use cases. So the first use case we're going to see is going to be RAG, but it will have a web fallback. And then we'll change the example slightly and make this uh, early routing pipeline with fallback. And as last, we'll see extracting structured data and what can go wrong there. So I have this RAG pipeline, it's great, it's working fine, but what if the user comes and asks me again, and asks me about an information that, that is not found in my document store? So what happens then? Um, best case scenario, your large language model will return an answer like that, saying that it couldn't find relevant information, it doesn't have relevant information to answer that question. But this means that I have no answer, although I have a reply coming from the LLM. But for some cases, this might not be a something that I would like to show to my users or, or, or something that I would like to return from this pipeline. And in that case, what I can do is an implement a fallback mechanism with routing. So here, what I do is I just add an ex extra component, a conditional router, right after my RAG pipeline. And this conditional router can then decide whether this was a valid answer to the query or it was just a reply coming from the LLM saying that the answer is now found. And when that's the case, it can just direct it to web. Uh, but to make this example work, we need to make some changes in our RAG pipeline. So let's see what we need to change there. This is going to be our new prompt template. So the, the rest is just RAG, but I only have one extra line here with, highlighted with blue. And here I say my model that if there is no information about this query in the given documents, answer with the no answer phrase. And this becomes my indicator that LLM couldn't find an answer to that question. And then I define the conditions in my conditional router. And how I do it is basically, again, you following a ginger syntax, I check the replies coming from the LLM, and, and if I found the uh, no answer phrase, I say that, okay, direct the query to the go to web search branch. As the else statement, I check the replies again, and if the no answer is not found in the reply, it, 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 which means that uh, there was a valid answer, then I just return that as the answer to my query, and I pass these routes or these conditions to my conditional router as I initialize it. All right, so now we know how the conditional router routes the query to the relevant branch. Then I just implement a web search here. And how I do it is basically I have this, I can just use this web search component that goes to web, finds some relevant information in the web, and returns that as documents, just like a retriever, but from different source. And then the rest is just like RAG, prompt builder can get relevant documents and the user query, and then generate the answer with the generator. So now when I ask about this information, instead of saying that I couldn't find that info, it can just go and check the web and find the next concert of Taylor Swift. Uh, but of course, your fallback branch, so the other branch, doesn't have to be web. 
As the alternative source, you can use Notion, you can use Google Drive, or maybe you don't want to use another source, but maybe you just want a Slack notification, and you just want to log it into your system so that you are aware that users tried this query, but they couldn't find any answer. Maybe then you can use this information to evaluate your pipeline. This is also very valuable to implement in your system. So this was the first. Um, this, was what, this one was the first example, first use case that I'd like to share with you. Let's look at the second one. It's early routing. So it's, it can be used in a very similar way, but it has a different architecture than this conditional router example that I showed before. So in this one, I don't have a RAG pipeline here. I, I don't do any retriever, retrieval here. And instead, I have some branches that I know that I can direct my query, and I provide that branch information to my prompt builder, and then let the generator decide which branch this query should follow. So if I go there one by one, prompt builder has this branch option information, creates this prompt, and then generator decides which branch it should follow, and the router just directs the, route, uh, directs the query to the relevant branch. Um, if you are familiar with the agent concept, this is quite similar to that one. It's very similar to the tool selection process. Um, so um, in, in agents, each of these branches can be tools, um, but here we can just say them as branches. Um, the key part here is the prompt builder, so let's take a look at the prompt and see how we need to structure our prompt to make sure that this system works. This is my relatively wrong, long prompt. It's longer than RAG, but it's definitely not a big deal. Um, maybe it's very hard to see, but I'll explain you one by one, just to make sure that we know what's going on here. So first, here I provide the branches, but since these large language models are familiar with the tool concept, why not I just introduce my branches as tools? So here as tool names, I just give the names of my branches, and then as the tool description, I, I explain when and why my large language model should select this branch. So for example, for, for web search, I say that if you need to Google search, so if you need information about recent events, and I have another branch, it's called Haystack, search Haystack, which is, like, which, which is going to use the documents, the Haystack documentation to answer some of those questions. And here I also explain that. And as the next step here, I say that if you cannot match user query to the listed tools, then respond with none. And this is going to be my fallback branch. So I give an option to my large language model and say that, OK, if, if you cannot find the relevant tool in the list above, don't make up any tool. Just use this none branch, because otherwise I cannot handle this situation. But if I have this none option, I can. And then I use this few shot prompting and provide some examples. So I provide the queries and what the LLM should return as the uh, branch option. So I have some examples here. And as the last step, I give my query, and I, then I expect my large language model to return a relevant branch for that. And the conditional router part is quite similar. For, each of them was a branch, and then they are, again, the branch. So for each of them, I check the replies coming from the LLM. If, it, if the first one is search haystack, it's, it's going to follow that branch. If the, first, if the other one is search web, it's going to follow search web. And if it's the none, so this is my fallback, it's going to use the other branch that I have. And if I extend this pipeline, this is what it looks like. So in the search haystack branch, I have something very similar to RAG, but without embedder. Maybe I'm doing a keyword search here, so I don't need an embedder. Here I have the web search, so web search component, prompt builder, and generator. And as the fallback branch, I just use my generator without any relevant context, any additional action. 
So this time, for example, when the query is, how should I use the OpenAI chat generator? This is definitely a question related to Haystack. My large language model returns a response like this one. So it tells me the, that I should go to search Haystack branch. So it doesn't re just return this phrase, but that's OK. I can just check the string. And if I can support this branch name, that's enough for me. So then uh, to answer that question, I'll just follow this branch. And if my query is about something very recent happening, for example, when the, Ber when the Berlin Buzzwords 2024 is, then the large language model will return as search web, and I will then route my query to this web search branch. And if there's a question that doesn't fit, that doesn't fit any of the information above, or maybe my model can just answer that with common sense, with just pure LLM knowledge. For example, what's the na first name of Einstein? And then it will just use the non-branch and just use pure LLM's knowledge for that. And something that you can do further here is to go clever and maybe combine these two branches into one branch at some point. Because in the end of the day, both Retriever and Web Search provides you the relevant information. And the prompt builder just can use that information to, to generate the answer. So you don't need two prompt builder or two generators unless you like to use different prompts and different large language models for them. Um, this brings us to the last use case that I'd like to show, uh, share with you. Um, if you have been to the talks today, there was a talk very good in this area about creating solar queries using large language models. And this, the idea is uh, the same. So I, liked, I have some unstructured text. It can be a document that I have, but it can be just a natural language query coming from the user. And there is some structured information that I like to extract from this text. And for example, it can be a JSON that I like to fill in. And how I make that work with Haystack looks like this. So I feed both of these information to my prompt builder. Then my generator can try to generate, try to extract the structured data from this unstructured text. For example, uh, I, you, I have this text. It's quite a short one, but it's about cities, capitals, and their population. And then I have this. A Pydentic model. So I'm using Pydentic model here because it's very easy to, to generate the JSON schema from Pydentic models. And here I have the city class that has name, country, and population. And then I like to get the list of cities as cities data. And then I feed both of these information to my prompt builder, and I hope that my generator will be able to generate create this valid JSON from this text. But sometimes it fails. Sometimes it fails to create the valid JSON, but sometimes it fails to create a compliant JSON from that text, for example, something like that. So here, I have information about Berlin. I have information about Paris. But for Lisbon, the country is missing here. So this is still a valid JSON, but it doesn't comply with, uh, it doesn't comply with the model that I define here. Uh, what do I do in, in a case like this? Have you ever tried to work on an example like that? So, I mean, usually, the first thing that came to my mind was looping. So it's like I can create an autocorrection, maybe a validation loop here, and try to maybe instruct my LLM further to fix this JSON, because it has the information. Maybe it just needs a little push. So what I do here is I have this custom component, output validator. And this output validator has the information about this JSON and this unstructured text, because it has, it, it has the reply coming from the LLM. And it checks if the reply coming from the LLM is compliant with this JSON schema. 
If it is, then that's great, it's a valid reply. But if it's not, then it will return that information back to my prompt builder to, to inform my large language model further that, okay, you gave me this JSON, but it was invalid and the error message was that. So let's look at this output validator. This is a custom component. This is how you would define a custom component in Haystack. And that's the code that you need. There is this small component decorator here and here, but these are just to make sure that you can plug this component into your pipeline. And then what you need to do is to, here I have the init method for this class, but this is not mandatory. Um, but what mandatory is this run method that I should implement. And what I do here is to basically a try and accept statement. In the try part, I try to load this reply as JSON, and then I try to parse it to make sure that it, it is adhering to the PyDentic model that I define. If it passes, then it's a valid reply returning from the output validator. But if it fails, then I just return the invalid reply with the error message that was thrown. And this is the prompt template for this use case. I, I said that like, Jinja syntax is quite helpful here, because in the first run, I only provide this information saying that, OK, I'd like you to create this JSON object based on this schema and based on this passage that I'm going to provide you. But if, I, if it's the second run of this prompt builder, so if there's an information coming from the output validator, such as invalid replies and error message, then I extend my prompt with the invalid replies and error message that, OK, that was the reply, that was the error message, correct the output and try again. And, and hopefully, by giving it a, a little bit of nudge, my LLM will achieve to uh, create this valid JSON object. Um, let's look at the pipeline code of it and how we create loops in Haystack. So something that I do differently here is I define a max loops allowed parameter as I create my pipeline. As you can imagine, like when you have loops in your pipeline, it can go into this infinite loop. Uh, and by providing a number, an arbitrary number here, I make sure that it doesn't stuck in this infinite loop and it exits at some point by throwing an error at, I mean, uh, as the worst case. And then I add my components one by one. I only had three components, so that's not a big deal. Prompt builder, generator, and the output validator. And then I connect these components to each other. So prompt builder to LLM, LLM to the output validator. And this part is where I create the loop. So the invalid replies and the error message coming from the output validator is going back to the prompt builder and prompt, bu prompt builder's invalid replies and prompt builder error message. Then I give the passage that I show you and run my pipeline by passing the passage and the JSON scheme information to my prompt builder. So hopefully this time when I try to run this pipeline, after a couple of loops, it generates a, a valid JSON for me. All right, let's do a little recap. So fallbacks are handy to make a search in alternative sources. And this alternative sources can be a different database that you have, can be your Notion, can be your Google Drive. Uh, but these fallback branches are also useful to trigger actions, so to log your data, to log your failures, and then use that information later on. If you have defined options, then maybe you can think about giving that information to your prompt builder and do early routing, rather than running your pipeline in with RAG first. And loops are great if you need validation and autocorrection in your system. So these are the sources that I use in this presentation. All of them are a, Pi, are a Google Collab notebook. Um, first one is for 
web uh, fallback to web example, second one is early routing, and the third one is generating structured output. You can check the code, you can try with different models, with different prompts. Maybe you're, you're not going to use a JSON schema, but you're going to use an SQL query there. Um, give it a chance. Uh, thank you for listening. And if you're interested in Haystack, there is a QR code to the website of Haystack. And there you can find the documentation, tutorials, cookbooks, and articles about building with large language models. And you can also join our community on Discord. You'll also find the link there. And if you have any questions and or like to connect on social media, I also left the information there. I think we have some time to answer some questions. So shoot. Thank you. So, hello, hi. hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, when you do this validation loop, yeah. Have you experienced any hallucination um, when gathering like a second or third try, or do you also test on hallucination? Um, what you can do, I, I saw some hallucination with some models. For example, I try to use, maybe I can go back to that example to make, okay. So here, uh, I have all of the information that I need in this text, right? And I have name, country, and population for each city. But I try that with a different example, and I removed the population information from this text but, but, and made the population optional. So if there's an information about population, my model was trying to put that information to JSON. But if there's no information, that's also valid, right? You can just put null here. Um, so I tried that. Model failed in the first try. And in the second try, it just filled that information with some random information. So it basically hallucinated. Uh, and for that one, then I put another validation right after this branch. So if I go here, all right. Maybe what you can do here is to put another prompt builder and a generator just to make a sanity check. So you provide your JSON, and then you provide the text, and say that, OK, can, I, can you extract this JSON, like every field in JSON, with, from this text? And that also, if you do it with OpenAI models, that works. So it's, it tells you whether you could extract that information or not. So that, that could be an architecture that you can uh, have if you like, if you think that that can be a hallucination. Thank you. Hi. Um, what kind of performance uh, issues uh, you may see in terms of latencies? Because I see there are multiple connectors to different API calls. Do you also have some sort of retries if uh, the connections are failing or, mm. um, yeah, where is the cutoff for, yeah, this third party? Yeah, good question. I haven't checked um, the latency, so I don't have the benchmarks for it. But for this example, so usually you do at least two LLM queries, so LLM calls here. First, this one and then later on this here. So you, your user enters the query, and till, till it gets an answer, there is this two calls. Yeah, based on the model that you are using, this can take a while. And especially, for example, if, you are, if your database is quite large and if you are using a local one. I tried that with an, uh, in memory document store, so it was running locally. It wasn't very fast. but. This part usually takes around two seconds, and this part around like three to four seconds in my tests. Um, not the best, but it's very LLM dependent, so there's not much I can do because I'm doing this API calls. Um, but you can even you can definitely try to go um, shorter with the prompts so that it 
generates answers quickly. But it will be wrong if I say that I benchmarked it and that's the result. And, and if you get 404 from the web calls, like are there ways to handling those uh, interactions also? Yeah, this, is, this wasn't something that I uh, incorporated into my pipeline. OK, OK. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, uh, great presentation. Um, Thank you. Uh, I wanted to understand like how you guys are plan uh, doing the mapping. Let's say you are making different API calls to different LLM models where you get a output response from the LLM models and then you try to create a query for your different retriever, different generator as well. So how is the mapping process happening? Like when you map one JSON response to another JSON response in the input query. Uh, are you asking about the, the last example that I showed? No, I'm talking about the pipeline. When you create the pipeline, yeah. you, you have like, you add a embedder, and then you add a retriever, and then generator. So you get a response from an LLM model. Uh, you pick up some values out of it. Then you pass it to uh, the next generator, the retriever. So how does the mapping happen in the background? All right, so the data flow, I think you're asking about the data flow yeah. in the pipeline, yeah. yeah. So. Um, for this one, it's quite simple because this is in natural language. So this is basically a string. Then prompt builder returns a string and the generator returns a string. I mean, the, I make sure that it returns in a valid format so that I can connect it to my next uh, component. And here, generator again returns in string. But if we go back to the rag one, maybe I can show a different example here. Oh. It's so behind. All right, here, for example, here I give the query uh, in natural language and then embedder returns me the embedding, right? This is a list of numbers. But retriever waits for that list of numbers. That's why I can connect my embedder to my retriever. I cannot connect my embedder directly to my prompt builder because my prompt builder waits for a natural language string. And then retriever returns haystack documents object. And my prompt builder can process that. Because if you remember, here I have the document object, and it has its content. So I'm using the haystacks document class here, so that I make sure that inputs and the outputs match. And the rest is just like prompt builder string and the generator string. So does that answer your question? But of course, for different pipelines, there are different data types that you stream down the pipeline. Any more questions? If not, then thank you, Birger, for the presentation and for responding to the questions. Thank you. And we will now have a short coffee break, and we'll be back at 2.30.